Okay, so welcome back. Um, the uh, stopping point last time was um, our. I gave an overview of what happened when we uh, took our group of transformations, the fractional linear transformations, and extended them uh, to uh, the plane rather than just the line, right? So from last time, we have fractional linear transformations look like this right these were the transformations that gave rp1 uh the geometry uh that uh, uh that we're familiar with but um you know our our intuition here for wanting to extend rp1 basically to add another dimension to rp1 so take rp1 think about it as um a line in uh, you know, sitting in some plane that doesn't yet exist yet, and then extending that line in one direction to make it uh, a plane that has that line as its boundary, right? So that line is like the line at infinity uh, for this plane that we're extending. And so um, the the reason for wanting to do this is because uh, there's just not you can't really see what's going on in one D, right? In one dimension, uh, it's kind of hard to see what's happening. Um, and so, um, by extending this, uh, we get a fuller picture. Now, of course, to extend this, right, the kind of brute force simplest idea is to just replace our real variable, right? So X is just a real number, uh, to replace that with, uh, a complex number Z, right? Viewing a point in the plane as, uh, a complex number, uh, and replacing this variable with a complex number. Now, um, the problem here uh, is that um, when we try to do this extension, uh, there's some hiccups that we have to overcome. So, for instance, I gave you an example of one uh, where here, you know, this reflection, uh, this transformation that is here, this is just a transformation, B, C, and D are all zero, and, uh, or sorry, I should say, <laughs> B and C are zero, D is one, uh, and A is minus one, right, is is this transformation. Um, so uh, this sends X to minus X. So this is simple transformation, a fractional linear transformation. But what would this extend to? It can't extend to the obvious thing uh, because the transformation sending Z to minus Z maps the upper half plane to the lower half plane, right? And we saw that this is a problem because those two half planes are separated by my boundary. Right, and points, you know, split between those two halves can never interact with one another. Um, right, you can't cross that boundary. And so we want to do this extension in such a way that it maps um, uh, the upper half plane to the upper half plane. Or, like I said, we, we could do this same construction on the lower half plane just as well. Okay, so that's that was our uh, intuition. Okay, now, uh, of course... Um, as I mentioned, you know, so when, when we finish this, we get a description of the upper half plane, but the transformation group that we consider um, is going to be some properly uh, extended uh, transformations that look like this. Okay, so we have to, we still have to nail this down, uh, which is what we will spend the rest of the course doing. Uh, but we have transformations that look like this. So here's our transformation group. Okay, and this is why this has to wait till the very end, because we are doing the Kleinian program, right? Klein's Erlangen program of we start with the transformation group. So we start with our group of transformations. Like I said, that we've extended in some way. These are, you know, extended from RP1. And we ask what kind of geometry arises, right? So what kind of geometry arises? And so I drew this picture last time. Um, where we have group of transformations and we ask, uh, what kind of geometry do we get? And I gave an overview last time of what it is that, that happens here. So the type of geometry, uh, is one that satisfies all the Euclidean postulates except the parallel postulate. Okay. So, uh, there are, so Lines are uniquely determined by two points, right? That's, that is satisfied. 
Um, so lines are uniquely determined um, by two points. Um, we have a notion of parallel lines, of course. Um, so we can we can discuss uh, parallel lines here. Uh, with you know, so I listed two lines here, right, that are parallel because they don't touch. But of course, you know, you're like, why are these lines? So what are the lines in our uh, uh, in this space? Well, the lines, right, lines are either vertical or are uh, semicircles centered on the x-axis. Of course, this x-axis we are viewing as our copy of RP1, right? So this x-axis is where we're viewing RP1 as being the boundary of this upper half point. Okay. So, what other things are true about this geometry? So the lines look funny, right? So lines in this geometry look funny. We also get a distance or length, right? And this is surprising because there was no distance in RP1. Uh, RP1 is, you know, our, the geometry of RP1 was projective geometry. In projective geometry, you have no notion of length or distance. Um, and so... So it is surprising that we take RP1, uh, we consider transformations on RP1, we extend that uh, to the upper half plane in some consistent way. Uh, and then the geometry that results, well, an, a notion of length pops out of it. But it's a non-Euclidean notion of length. So my example uh, that I gave last time of what, you know, what this means, for instance, what's an example of this behaving strangely is that depending on the on the scale here like this length and this length are the same okay these would be two equal lengths for instance okay um so this is this is weird um this is not you know a, a usual notion of length that we're uh familiar with but nevertheless this is going to be uh in a very you know precise uh manner um, a length or a distance okay all right and so um this is this is the overview this is the type of geometry this is like some of the basic uh foundational things that go on in this geometry but the big question is why right so why is that the geometry that we get um and how can i uh see that this is the geometry that that I get. Okay, um, and so uh, you know, that's what we're going to spend uh, the rest of the time uh, going over. So, uh, question: um, Why do I get such a geometry? And uh, the answer is, um, well see over the next say three to four lectures basically all the lectures that remain okay okay so the first thing to note before I move on to talking about this extension uh, of um, of uh, these transformations and, and exactly what this does um, so uh, note um, one property of Euclidean lines that we get in our new setting is that uh, um, there's unique determination of line between two points. Okay, so why do we get this? Well, there's two cases, right? Like either there's a Euclidean line, X is equal to L, and the two points lie on that Euclidean line, 
well, in that case, the line segment from the points, say P and Q, uh, would be the segment of that line, and the line containing them, of course, would be uh, just the Euclidean line, uh, X equals L. So if they're vertical, then it's just the Euclidean case. If they're not vertical, uh, if P, P and Q are not vertical, however, um, then there is a unique point, say R, on the x-axis that is equidistant to both of them. Right? I.e., take the equidistant line of P and Q, it meets the x-axis somewhere. Uh, wherever it meets the x-axis, we call that point R. Okay. Okay, so then uh, the semicircle with uh, center R uh, in the upper half plane. is the line through P and Q. So this is uniquely determined because R is unique. Okay. Now you might fuss a little bit because, uh, you know, this of course uh, follows from my assertion that lines are these objects, right? They're either vertical lines or they are semicircles, right? Centered on the x-axis. Um, so if, uh, if you believe that those are going to pass as my lines, then we get, um, we get this first, uh, postulate of Euclid, um, uh, straight from that. Now, of course, I need to actually show that those things are the lines that I get, uh, before, you know, this would be allowed, but we get the first, uh, the first postulate of Euclid from this. Note that this is already different from spherical geometry because um, in spherical geometry, like I said, take the north and south pole. Um, you know, so the north and south pole, there are infinitely many lines that, that pass through uh, those two points, right? Literally take any, uh, you know, meridian line that you want, uh, take any great circle passing through them, and of course there's multiple, uh, uh, multiple choices, so not unique. Okay. Um, so, in order to understand what's going on here, we have to better understand this extension. So, uh, in order to understand why uh, this geometry arises, we must better understand our extension that takes uh, a linear fractional transformation and extends it in some way to this type of transformation, okay, involving complex numbers, okay. And so the first step in doing that is understanding that with complex numbers, there's a sort of uh, map, uh, or there's a sort of operation that you can't really do to real numbers because it doesn't have any apparent um, effect. Okay, and so uh, the notion that it's complex conjugation. Okay. So complex conjugation is going to, to show up. So what is complex conjugation? Uh, if I have uh, a complex number z that we'll say is uh, a plus ib, okay, just for the sake of it. Or maybe I should write it as x plus iy since I'm using a and b here. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Yep, so let me write my complex number as x plus iy. Okay, then um, the complex conjugate of this thing is x minus iy. 
So you see how the complex conjugate leaves the real part of this complex number unfazed. So this would be a thing that is not apparent um, if you're talking about a transformation of real numbers, right? Because to a re if Z is actually on the real line, this doesn't do anything. Okay. So uh, recall earlier to understand fractional linear transformations. Uh, we uh, instead started with their building blocks. Right. So we started with their uh, building blocks, right, which was uh, a set of a type of transformation from which we had uh, homework around that time. I think it was homework. Was it homework three or homework four? I think it was homework four. Um, that uh, where, where you did some computations of these things. So in this case, what were the generating transformations for uh, linear fractional transformation? So linear fractional transformation look like this. Uh, so AX plus B over CX plus D. Uh, the generating transformations were translations. So X getting sent to X plus L. Uh, dilations, so X getting sent to KX. Right, that was the thing, and then uh, the inversions, so x getting sent to one over x. Right, uh, and of course uh, we couldn't have k be zero, um, and uh, uh, so we couldn't have k be zero, um, and l could be whatever because we're we're just translating. So other than that, th these were the generating transformations. So. Um, a generic fractional linear transformation with some combination of these and vice versa. Um, if you take general combination of these, every single one of these transformations is an example of a fractional linear transformation, uh, as you can see. Okay. Um, and so uh, the idea is to, um, uh, is to come up with generating transformations for this extension, right? So the idea is uh, come up with generating transformations for our extension of these things. So our extension to the upper half plane. And remember the main thing that we want to impose here is that this should these things we should extend them in a way that they map the upper upper half plane to the upper half plane. Okay, we don't want to mixing uh, the planes. Okay. All right. So, um, what is the idea here? Okay. Well, let's start with that example that we did before. So, what is the proper extension to the upper half plane. Of the map that sends X to minus X. Right. So we already saw, so we saw earlier that uh, Z getting sent to minus Z is no good. Okay, so in order to see what's going on here, let's go back to this picture so that I don't have to redraw it. Here's my upper half plane. Okay, now let's say, so here's my origin, right? Here's my x-axis. This is my copy of RP1 here. Okay. So let's say I have a point, I'm going to add in a dash here, and let's say I have a point X, okay, on my copy of RP1. Uh, where is minus X here? Well, minus X is just reflected across the Y axis here, over here. Is that, is that pretty good? I think that's a pretty good estimation. There's my minus x. Well, I'm a little bit short. It needed to be a little bit further, but here's my minus x, okay? All right, just bear with me. 
So x gets sent to minus x. It's a reflection across this y-axis, right? This line through the origin here. Now, um, what would happen to this z? Right? What would happen to this z? Well, if I sent z to minus z, this z gets mapped down here. Right? And we don't want that, one, because it is sending it to the lower half plane. We don't want that. But also, geometrically, this is just this transformation would not be doing the same thing as this transformation that sent x to minus x. So geometrically, what do we want? We want to send z to a point that is like over here, right? What would this point be? Right? What would what would this point be? How would we describe what this point is? So we would want this point to be, I mean, if you did it in coordinates, right? If you're associating Z to ordered pair AB, this is going to be a complex number that is minus A plus IB, right? So this is what we want to send a Z that is, um, well, I'm writing it as A plus IB again instead of Let's uh, let's let's correct that. Let's replace this with x plus i y. And here I would be sending this to uh, minus x, right? Plus i y. Okay. Okay. All right. Just makes the notation look better. Okay. Um. So, what what is this thing? Well. Let's, we can just work it out directly. Um, I had mentioned complex conjugation before, so that's where this comes in. Uh, this is not the complex conjugate, because the complex conjugate of Z is actually... Where's the complex conjugate of Z? It's, it's down here. Right, the complex conjugate of Z, here's... This is uh, Z bar... This is x minus i, y. So then what is minus x plus i, y? It is minus the complex conjugate of z. Okay. So the answer is the transformation that sends z to minus its complex conjugate. Okay, so this is what does it. Okay, so note, uh, right, if z is x plus i y, then uh, minus z bar is minus x plus i y bar. The complex conjugate of that is x minus i y. So this is minus x minus i y, which is minus x plus i y, which is exactly what we wanted geometrically. Okay. So going back, taking you back to that picture I drew, Geometrically, the idea was I have an you know a transformation since x to minus x. Geometrically, what that do what that is doing is reflecting across this line. So if I have a point in the upper half plane, I want it to geometrically do the exact same thing. But in order to do that, algebraically, I have to say z gets sent to minus z bar, right? Minus the complex conjugate of z. Okay. Thus, this allows us to extend all of the uh, dilations. So this allows us to extend all dilations, all right? So maybe I'll put a star next to this because this is important. So how do I extend the dilation that sends x to kx, right? 
Because this is just one of them, right? This x is getting sent to minus x here. So how do I send x to kx? Okay, well, um, this extends to x getting sent, or not going to use x there. That'd be mega confusing. This extends to z getting sent to k z bar. So this is uh, yeah, when k is less than zero, I should say. Okay, I don't need to do. I don't need to do this trick otherwise. Okay. All right. So this was my this is my trick. I actually don't need to. Um, so note when k is greater than zero, the extension of dilation of x by k is just dilation of z by k. Okay. So there's two cases here. Right? There's dilation by a f scale factor that is negative and there's dilation by a scale factor that is positive so in the case of this is positive and again geometrically you can think about what's going on here let me bring back my picture so geometrically what is scaling by some k uh, that is uh, positive going to do well, it's either going to, if k is less than 1, it's going to move it closer to the origin. And if it is, uh, but it's going to do that, it's going to scale both coordinates, right? Uh, so, um, and if it is, if k is larger than 1, it's going to move it away from the origin like this. But actually, that's, this is going to have the exact same, uh, like the, the proper way to think about this uh, for a complex number is exactly, um, is exactly the same thing because what's going to happen is it's going to either move it closer to the origin, right? Now we have an extra dimension, but it's going to move it closer to the origin if uh, if k is less than 1. If k is bigger than 1, it's going to move it away from the origin uh, by that scale factor, right? And so, yeah, it's not moving it in a line, but it's moving it uh, in a line through the origin, right? Not this horizontal line, though. Okay, but geometrically, this is the same. Uh, this is at least the same notion that's going on. Okay. All right, so this is a big hurdle. Uh, this is a big hurdle to get over. Um, why? So we have extended all dilations, so we'll call that part one. Okay. Part two, the translations are easy to extend. So what do I do to extend the translations? A translation that sends x to x plus l, this extends to a translation of complex numbers. So z gets set to z plus l. Okay. Okay. So you can just check really quickly. Does this map the upper half plane onto itself? Yes, right? Definitely does. Uh, and geometrically, this is exactly the notion of, of translation. Okay. All right. And so uh, from our list of generating uh, transformations, right, we have checked off a couple. We have done translations, and now we've done dilations. So we have one more to do, and that's inversions. Okay, and then we will have the generating transformations for these extended um, transformations. Okay, so um, next natural question is, uh, what about, so how do I extend the 
transformation that sends x to 1 over x. Right? Okay. Note, trying the obvious thing doesn't work. Right, this maps upper half plane. So this maps upper half plane to uh, uh, potentially lower half plane. Okay, so it doesn't keep the upper half plane mapped to itself. Okay. All right, um, so that doesn't work. So then, what do I what do I do to to make geometric sense of what's going on here? So the idea is to write z in its polar form. So you use polar coordinates to express complex number. So any complex number z, that's uh, x plus i y, can also be written as some radius r. Uh, times uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta, right? Okay. All right. Well, then, if we look at what one over z is, I mean, what is what is one over z using this this polar form here? Well, this would be 1 over r times cosine theta minus i sine theta. Okay. But this is 1 over r times cosine of minus theta, since they match up, plus i sine of minus theta. So sine is odd, cosine is even, so I can rewrite this in this way. This is just to show, thus, z at angle theta and 1 over z at angle minus theta have opposite slopes from the origin. So they lie in different half planes typically. Where did I get this? How do you invert? How do you invert a complex number anyway? All right. So how do you invert a complex number? What is what is one over z for uh, a complex number written like this? All right. So remember that one over z is using the complex conjugate. You can express this. This is the complex conjugate of z over the length of z squared. Okay. All right. And so, from this, of course, the length of z here is r. So this is complex conjugate over uh, over r squared. Sorry, length of length of z is. Uh, is uh, uh, square root of r here. So uh, um, so this uh, length of z squared is uh, is r. So is one over r times the conjugate of of z, which is written in polar form as cosine theta minus i sine theta. So anyway, that's that's where this first step comes from. Okay, so um, uh, these things lie in different half planes. Um, uh, now. What that means is that I want to draw a picture that allows me to map 
uh, complex number z to some reasonable expression that keeps geometrically what it is I'm doing here. So like what is, if I'm just looking at the normal complex plane, what is it that I'm doing when I go from z to 1 over z? Okay. So this is, and you can just plot these points here. Um, this, uh, this is, uh, it can be kind of hard to think about, but this is inversion in a circle is what's happening. Okay. So to see what it is or how this should be, right, since these lie in different half planes typically, and that's, that's no good. We want them to, to be in the same half plane, so the upper half plane for us. Okay, um, so then the proper extension of uh, the map that sends uh, x to 1 over x is uh, the map that sends uh, z to 1 over z bar. Okay, so let's write out what these things are. If Z has polar form uh, R uh, cosine theta plus uh, I sine theta, um, then uh, 1 over Z bar is going to have polar form 1 over R cosine theta plus I sine theta. Okay. And so what this transformation actually does is it takes a complex number written in polar form, writes it almost in the same polar form except it's R, its radius R goes from R to 1 over R. <laughs> so, so that's the that's what's going on. Now geometrically, what does this look like? Um, so let's uh, let's draw a decent picture here. Let me I don't feel like drawing an actual semicircle nicely. Let's let's draw a big picture here. So maybe I'll. So here's my x-axis. Okay, this is maybe I should have done that in red to show that it's not. Uh, you know, you're not allowed. Oh, I need to extend it anyway. Let me extend it a little bit. Okay, so here's my x-axis, my copy of RP1. Here's uh, my nice big semicircle here. Um, so we'll say this is unit circle. Okay, so then the center here is O. Okay, and I have some point X on my copy of RP1. Okay, I'm going to view this as the Y axis. All right, so here's my y-axis. Here's my origin. Um, here's point x. Where does this map uh, when I map this to 1 over x? Well, it maps to like right here. All right, here's 1 over x. Okay. All right. So then let's say I have a point um, z. Okay, so determine Z's, to determine Z's polar form, I'm going to draw a line here out to Z from the origin. This has some angular measurement theta. Okay, how do I determine the proper extension of this map 
that sends x to 1 over x, what do I want to send z? I'm claiming that I want to send z to 1 over its complex conjugate. Now, um, the reason why this is a little bit trickier than the other one is that it's harder to see that what's going on with this inversion is inversion in unit circle. Um, so, like, what what happens here? Z gets sent to 1 over Z bar. 1 over Z bar is, like, here. Okay. All right, so if you actually, right, this thing is R cosine uh, theta plus I sine theta then uh, 1 over z bar is uh, 1 over r. Right, this is 1 over r uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta. And so inverting this radius, right, you're on the same line. Inverting this radius is called inversion in unit circle because you go from some point here outside unit circle to its corresponding point inverted on the other side of, of unit circle here. Okay, and similarly, if you had a point Z that was inside unit circle, it would be inverted outside of unit circle, since R would be less than 1, so 1 over R would be bigger than 1, and so you'd be outside unit circle. Okay. Okay. And so, in summary, we have extended everything. Oh, we have extended all of the generating transformations. All right. And so, this is good news. Uh, so, in summary, um, Our extension of fractional linear transformations AX plus B over CX plus D uh, of RP1 uh, to the upper half plane I mean I should say our extensions are generated by Okay, meaning in general, they are combinations of the following. So, uh, one, horizontal translations. Which send complex number to complex number plus L. Two, typical dilations. So, dilations that send Z to KZ for K positive reflection in the Y axis which is Z getting mapped to minus Z bar and reflection in unit circle or reflection or inversion in unit circle So Z gets sent to 1 over Z bar. Okay. So these generate transformations. f of z is az plus b over cz plus d in the same way that we got linear fractional transformations. Um, these are called Morbius transformations. Okay. All 
All right, so this is uh, this is the key. Uh, this is the key thing. These Merbius transformations are our transformation group for the upper half plane. All right, so we'll talk more about those uh, later as well. Anyway, um, so rather than get into now these equations for these non-Euclidean lines, I think this is a good stopping point. So uh, on Monday we will do uh, so. On Monday, we will see what the equations for non-Euclidean lines look like. And the idea is that um, this is the fact that we're able to define these transformations and talk about them this way. We're going to have equations for non-Euclidean lines, and then we're going to get all kinds of geometric facts from this um, about how these Merbius transformations treat these lines. Okay, uh, and this is now we're getting to the heart of why this geometry of the upper half plane is going to look the way that it does. Okay, so um, so we're almost there. Like I said, we're going to get some beautiful pictures and there's actually a couple of very helpful um, videos that uh, that I plan on on linking you um, soon because they're uh, they're pretty short watches they're only a few minutes long and they do a really really good job of showing some of these hyperbolic geometry facts so anyway um, that's it for now so we have four more lectures which is going to be exactly enough to finish uh, the textbook so um, I will see you all on Monday.